Katamari Damacy's soundtrack is so weird and wonderful and full of absolute bangers, but today I want to take a look at just one of its many splendid offerings, the fan favorite Lonely Rolling Star. This is one of those songs where every element comes together to present a clever and completely unified whole. The composition, the production, the arrangement, and the perfect vocal performance work in concert together to create a fun and goofy atmosphere that always puts a smile on my face. But it goes beyond this, too. There's something about the song that has real staying power, a depth that sneaks in behind the sunny exterior and grabs a hold of your heartstrings when you're not looking. What on the surface looks like a cheery pop chorus ends up feeling more like an epic sing-along anthem by the the time you're through the song. Today I want to pick apart how the harmony and the melody of the song interact with each other and why that makes Lonely Rolling Star so great. So let's roll! Lonely Rolling Star's balance between depth and accessibility comes at least partially from how the composer, Yoshihito Yano, treats the melody and the harmony as almost completely separate entities. The melody functions the way a pop melody would throughout, written to be simple, easily singable, and centered around our tonic chord of E-flat major. The harmony functions more the way a jazz standards chord progression would, using upper extensions and borrowed out-of-key notes to take you on a journey out of and back into the home key in super interesting ways. This combination is very cool to me. The harmony of a pop song usually would follow the melody's lead, using the bare minimum diatonic chords to keep the focus solely on the melody and groove of the song. A jazz standards melody usually would follow the chord progression, emphasizing notes that accentuate all of the cool, colorful twists and turns that the harmony takes. Combining these two approaches brings the best that both styles of writing have to offer, and it's an approach that you'll find all over J-pop music in general. To show you what I mean, let's start from the top. On the melody side, Lonely Rolling Star's intro takes this melodic figure and repeats it. You'll notice the melody is constructed almost entirely out of the notes of our E-flat major triad, with the fourth, A-flat, used as a passing tone between the third and fifth. This very clearly expresses an E-flat major sound, except for the last note of the phrase. This is the only note that changes on each repetition of this phrase, descending by a half step on each iteration of the melody. This one note bridges the gap between the melody and the harmony. The chord progression underneath starts on the tonic E-flat and moves around the circle of fourths, giving us an E-flat to A-flat major 7 to D-flat 9 to G-flat major 7 progression, before sliding down to an F minor 7 to set up a return to our tonic E-flat chord. This secondary 5-7 to 1 to this G-flat major 7 chord introduces a lot of notes from outside the key of E-flat, but having the roots of each chord move in perfect fourths like this makes it feel a little more natural, like we're gradually moving farther and farther away from our home key. Above all of this motion, the melody sticks to its E-flat major sound, but the chromatically descending final note of each phrase is used to connect the melody to each chord by landing on a really strong chord tone right as we shift to the next chord. The first C is the third of our A-flat major 7, the next C-flat is the flat 7 of our D-flat 9 chord, and the B-flat is the third of the G-flat major 7 chord that follows. This great mix of upbeat pop accessibility and spicy jazz flavor comes at you right from the first moments of the tune. The melody-harmony dichotomy ends up being more than the sum of its parts, though. On their own, the chords aren't anything that crazy. They're just seventh chords with some basic mode mixture thrown in. It's the melody's implied E-flat major sound on top that gives the harmony a layer of extra complexity. Building a major triad off of the fifth of a major seven chord brings this really lush, beautiful major ninth kind of sound to the chord, and that's exactly the sound we get with the E-flat triad outlined in the melody above our A-flat major seven chord. The following D-flat 7 chord turns into a much spicier Lydian dominant kind of sound with the melody outlining the 9th, sharp 11th, and 13th, all of the upper extensions of the chord. The harmony isn't just giving the melody a little extra spice, the melody's giving the harmony another level of depth. It's a two-way street, baby! But don't just take my word for it, let's hear what it would sound like if the melody and harmony were more in line with each other. 
If we move each melodic phrase around to outline the underlying harmony, we can see what effect this has, or doesn't have, on the music compared to having the melody and harmony act more independently. The first phrase starts with a walk up from the 3rd to the 5th of our tonic E flat chord, so for each subsequent phrase we'll move the melody to start on the 3rd of whatever chord it's on top of. Let's hear how that sounds. Doesn't that just seem more flat and lifeless? Compared to the original, we are seriously lacking in depth, which is interesting because the original melody seems much simpler at first glance. Still, it's undoubtedly the superior melody here. Simpler in execution compared to our altered version, maybe, but more sophisticated. We can see this exact same relationship between the melody and the harmony play out in the verse, only this time without even one note connecting the melody and the chord progression. The verse melody is focused squarely on this simple motif, a short four-note figure. I love how this third note introduces just a little bit of push and pull to the phrase. Even though it sounds really simple, it has more life than just a straight four-repeated note phrase would. In the key of E flat, this phrase hits the third of the key, G, for half the verse, then drops down to hit the root, E flat, for the other half. Once again, the melody is implying the sound of an E flat major chord, and once again, it's contrasted with this circle of fourths progression underneath, implied entirely by the bass line. It's stripped down compared to the intro, but the effect of the static E flat melody and moving harmony is still there. Let's check out again how it would sound if the melody related to each chord in the progression rather than just keeping with an E-flat major sound throughout. That just feels all over the place. Once again, we've totally lost the effect that the original verse had, and lost the color of all of the interesting intervals between the bass and melody that occur when you have the two separated into different harmonic spaces. Skipping ahead to the bridge, we see an example of a different approach, the melody and harmony working more in concert together even while the melody maintains its focus on the tonic E-flat major. To set the stage, the song breaks us out of the rhythmic and harmonic box we've been in until now by drifting along over an A-flat pedal, shifting between different tonalities as A-flat major, A-flat melodic minor, and Lydian B-flat over A-flat sounds bathe us in dreamy synth textures. The synth waves come crashing down on you until we drop suddenly to this G minor 7 chord, which sounds extra dramatic after all the A-flat pedaling, and then the intensity of the arrangement is reduced to a whisper as the singer comes in over closed-voiced synth chords. On one level, the transitionary section can still be seen as keeping the melody and harmony in separate rooms from each other. The melody is really just a highly embellished walk down the E-flat major scale from the fifth to the root. But the harmony consists of a series of secondary resolutions. This E diminished 7 chord resolves to an F minor, with the suspended ninth adding a gorgeous moment of dissonance. Then the drop down to this D half diminished chord sets up a darker turn that gets quickly cut off with a secondary 2 5 1 to A flat major 7. What separates this section's writing from the verse or intros is that the melody is actually outlining the harmony pretty clearly. It almost always either hits the third or the fifth of the underlying chord, and its movement and resolutions line up with the way the harmony moves and resolves. But by finding the chord tones in the progression that work with the E-flat major scale and using only those notes, the melody can also maintain its simple, diatonic, approachable quality. In this way, the melody straddles the line between pop accessibility and jazz color even harder than before, by emphasizing the harmonic motion of the underlying chords without incorporating any of the more dissonant chromatic notes into the actual melody. This section then moves on to a big 5-bar, 4-5 to five chord buildup that rockets us into the chorus.
The chorus takes the same kind of approach to the extreme, with the harmony and melody joining forces for maximum power while still threading the needle between depth and accessibility. Beneath the simple E-flat major melody that just begs you to sing along, the chords are laid out in whole note pads that are voiced in very particular ways. We move from an E-flat in second inversion to an E-flat in root position to a B-flat minor 6 chord over a D-flat in the bass. This drops down to a C7 that would set up a move to F minor, but this is subverted as we move to an A flat major 7 instead. This then moves to an A flat minor major 7, preparing for a classic minor 4 to 1 resolution, but this gets a little extra dash of color as the bass implies a move to D flat 7 before we resolve up to E flat to start the phrase over again. In contrast to the earlier sections of the song, the melody here really outlines the harmonic progression. There is a second voice harmonizing above the melody for the chorus, and these two voices combined almost always give us the top and bottom notes of each specific voicing in the chord pads beneath. Of course, they're embellished a little bit so that we're not just listening to someone sing whole notes, but the fundamental structure of the melody and the chord part is the same. There are of course some notable exceptions to this observation in that the melody consistently avoids any notes not found in the key of E flat major. The harmony line jumps to a D flat over this B flat minor 6, but that's it. The E natural in the C7 chord and the C flat in this A flat minor to D flat 7 thing are both deftly avoided. This keeps the melody easily singable and simple and poppy and fun, and the structure of it is still very closely outlining our tonic E flat major for the most part, even while following the chord tones of this more adventurous chord progression. The forces of melody and harmony here are both so strong that I can't decide which one is following which. The melodic line is so catchy and singable and fun that it would make perfect sense to write the harmony around it, but the harmony is so colorful and interesting, and is such a great elaboration on the harmonic ideas established earlier in the piece, that I could also see the melody being written to mirror this great chord part. The fact that these two elements can both stand so strong on their own makes the fact that they work together here all the more powerful, perfect for an epic, climactic sing-along anthem. Let's finish out the chorus and enjoy the spicy B-flat sus flat 9 to B-flat 7 flat 9 move, with the harmonized walk down the E-flat major scale on top supercharging our return to our tonic E-flat. Well, that was the video. I hope you enjoyed it. Big thanks to patron Jonathan Piles for requesting Katamari. If you'd like to join my Patreon, you can check it out here for access to added benefits such as my transcription for this tune and every other tune I cover on this channel. You can follow me on Twitter here at 8-Bit Music Theory, and you can buy your loved ones lots of 8-Bit Music Theory notebooks for Christmas over at The Musician's Notebook. Thank you guys so much for watching, and I'll see you all next time.